This is Lisa from Mobile Tech Review, and here's a Windows convertible laptop that you guys have been asking for. This is the HP Spectre X360. Don't confuse it with the Envy X360. I, HP does a lot of similar but different names. This is the Spectre line, which means it's top of the line. It is a gorgeous unibody aluminum laptop, very thin, 3.2 pounds, 13.3 inch. And it's one of those, well, it yogas, like the Lenovo Yoga. So you open it up, and it's pretty stiff hinge. It's got a bunch of gears in there to actually keep it rigid, kind of no matter what. So it does that, it does that, it does that. It goes all the way back to tablet mode if you want to. Fifth generation Intel Broadwell CPUs inside. Full HD display. You can also go with the QHD display if you want. We're going to look at it now. So here it is, the HP Vector X360 is called the X360 because it does a 360 degree swivel with the hinge. Two chromed hinge here. Multi-geared thing that HP worked a lot on to make it smooth and rigid no matter what position you put it in. So, you know, it's the yoga principle right there. You can put it in tent mode. You can put it in presentation mode by doing this. And the keyboard will face down. Yes, it will. So you can interact with it like this. You can put it flat like a tablet. And this is what it looks like from the side. Given the contours of the bottom that do make it comfortable to hold, you can see there's a little bit of a space there. Now the rubber feet meet the lid, as you can see right as we open it up. So it's a sturdy thing going on and nothing is going to get scratched. That's just the way they designed it. As you can notice already, beautiful aluminum unibody design. HP CNC this out of a single piece of aluminum, the bottom part right here, the base. This plate, of course, is removable. Torx screws right here. Ventilation over here. We have the speakers on either side. No more Beats Audio branding. That deal has ended, but I'm not too upset by that. We have DTS Audio now, and honestly, a lot of the Beats laptops, I found them to be awful quiet through the speakers. was never that excited. This sounds much better through the speakers. We've got the jewel cut edges over here, so it's kind of shiny and silver. It really is just a stunning looking piece. HP has outdone themselves with looks. I don't think anybody's going to say, oh, the MacBook looks just so much prettier because this really, really is nice. So take a look at the edges right here. Beautifully done. There's our ventilation. This is where the fan exhausts out on the left side. Left-handed people, well, you'll get a hand warmer there. No, actually, it doesn't run that warm. Power button is on the side in case you're using it in tablet mode. We have a USB 3 port there. That's the power jack. SD card slot. Happily speaking, this card does not stick out. Well, just a little hair so you can you know, grab it again and poke it to get it out again. But it's not one of those where the card sticks halfway out. And on this side here, you can see the wedge-shaped design. There is our Windows button. This is the volume rocker right here in case you're using it in tablet mode. Mini display port plus full-size HDMI. Two more USB 3.0 ports. And this is our combo mic headphone jack. So well-equipped in, in terms of ports. The only thing you're not going to get here is Ethernet, which typically you don't get on a 13-inch Ultrabook. If you do, it's via a USB to Ethernet adapter. By the way, you don't get such an adapter in the box. If you need one, you're going to have to go ahead and buy one. The machine is pretty light at 3.2 pounds, not the lightest Ultrabook we've seen. Not as light as the Lenovo Yoga 3 Pro, which granted also runs on the Core M CPU. Lower power, needs less cooling, and all that sort of thing. So, and Plus, there's a heck of a lot of aluminum here. So 3.2 pounds, we can forgive it. And it's the same story with all 13.3-inch convertibles. For the most part, they're a little on the heavy side to be using as dedicated tablets all the time. And I suspect most people are probably going to be using them in presentation or tent modes when you want to go for that kind of ignore the keyboard approach. So inside this machine, we have Intel Core i5 and i7 CPU options. Fifth generation Broadwell, so a full power CPU there. We happen to have the Core i7 5500U model, 2.4 gigahertz base clock speed. Pretty good performance out of this when we get to the benchmark numbers, you'll see. One nice thing that HP did starting price is $899. That gets you the usual 4 gigs of RAM, 128 gig SSD. For $999, you get 8 gigs of RAM and a 256 gig SSD. So a better equipped, and that one will have a Core i5 5200U. No slouch there either in performance. All of these have Intel HD 5500 integrated graphics. Dedicated graphics on a thin and light Ultrabook, particularly a convertible, are just pretty rare. There's not enough room for the cooling. As you can see, we have the super-sized trackpad here. Now, HP used to call this the Control Zone trackpad on the previous Spectrum model that we looked at. This does not have the Control Zones masked on either side, where they were trying to make it easier for you to use the Charms menu and the Multitasking menu. 
I'm not really sure why they decided to continue using this really supersized trackpad that's just about the size of an iPhone 6, but it gives you more room. It's a Synaptics trackpad, and one nice thing is it actually has a control panel. We've been looking at a lot of Microsoft Signature Edition laptops lately that just have very basic drivers. This one has a full set of driver settings that you can work with. So there's our Synaptics clickpad right up there, and you can customize this to your heart's content. The good news is that it works very well. It's smooth. I haven't had any lagging on the trackpad. My only complaint would be is that because the right side is so far from the left side, well, sometimes when I want to right click, I have to make sure I'm moving far enough to the right side to actuate a right click. It kind of favors the left click, in other words, because in most cases, probably people want the dominant click or tap. You can tap to click as well if you want to. It's fine. You certainly have plenty of room for multi-finger gestures. Not that I ever felt so super duper crowded with it, but it works well. This is a backlight keyboard. Only one stage of backlighting. When the backlighting is off, that key stays illuminated. Just like if you happen to mute it, then the mute button lights up to give you a hint. So if we press that, it's pretty bright in here, so you're not going to see that much of a difference. But it's white backlighting. And in a dim room, I actually turn it off. If it's completely dark, then I'll turn it on because here's the thing. You got a light silver keyboard with kind of white key masking here. Not the greatest for contrast, so turning the backlighting on can actually make it a little bit harder to see the letters in a dim room. Other than that, HP is pretty proud of the fact that they went with 1.5 millimeter key travel, which is the standard for a non-skinny laptop, so you do get a lot of, well, travel on the keys. These are flat, squarish keys. They don't have any sculpting. And I thought, eh, it doesn't look that inspiring, you know, but boy, I actually typed a review on this and it was quite lovely to type on. Didn't make any errors, type very quickly. So it's a very good keyboard because this is all one milled CNC milled piece of aluminum. It's very rigid. You can't press down and make any trampolining on this. I don't care how heavy handed a typist you are. It's also a pretty normal layout. Nothing to complain about. There you go. Your multimedia controls on the top row right here embedded arrow pad. It's good to type on. It is. And it's got the slightly sunk down keyboard look that, well, it's pretty much standard for HP. The edges are not too sharp and too abrupt. I didn't have any problem with any of these edges digging into my hands or anything like that. So with all models except for the top of the line 1399 model, which has the Core i7, a 512 gig SSD, and the WQH D plus display that's 2560 by 1440 IPS. All the rest have a full HD 1920 by 1080 IPS display with bonded glass for more immediate looking colors, but God knows it doesn't do anything to help with glare. HP just is really the glare master, so it it, it has plenty of you know reflectivity. Color gamut, however, is excellent right there. 96% of sRGB and 76% of Adobe RGB right up there with the top ultrabooks on the market. Anything close to 100% sRGB is pretty much ideal. You're seeing every possible color in a web palette there. And in terms of brightness, let's take a look and see our brightness results. And here's our brightness white point test. You can see 335 nits of brightness. That's pretty impressive. Bright display there, folks. 0.51 for black levels. That's pretty good. 660 to 1 for contrast ratio. And the white point is at 6800. Now, color calibration out of the box was the typical, it's too cool. And let's take a look right now and switch that. Right now, we're looking at the uncalibrated display. And I'm going to turn on the calibration so you can see the difference. And things get a little bit warmer and a little bit more intense looking there without sacrificing much brightness, which means that this is a pretty good panel. By the way, you might see a little bit of flickering on screen. That's because the 60 hertz refresh rate of the screen can sometimes sync up with the 60p we're recording the video at. So overall, one of the first things I said when I took this out of the box is really nice screen. And also, I'm at 100% scaling right now on the desktop. So you can see the icon size and the text size. Let's open up a folder so you can see from more stuff right there. At 1080p, 13 inches, if you have good eyes, you can actually run at 100% scaling and avoid all those high DPI problems that you have with some Windows programs, third-party programs, really not supporting high DPI scaling well. But for those of you who are adventurous and want an even sharper display, say for photo editing, again, there is the 2560 by 1440 option from HP as well on the high-end model only right now in the United States. 
Now, Microsoft and HP work closely on this laptop, they say, and that means sharing engineering time together, not just passing a few memos, to really optimize the performance of this. So we saw some really good benchmark numbers on this, and empirically it feels very fast as well. Before we get into the absolute numbers, uh, you can see there's not a whole lot of bloatware on here. There's Netflix, which I think most people enjoy. You can remove that. McAfee's installed. Eh, I removed it. I, I just used Microsoft's own basic security suite that comes with Windows. It's fine with me. HP's own cloud file sharing, that sort of thing. So not too much junk on here whatsoever. Now, speaking of benchmarks, right here is the Crystal Disk Mark SSD score. Pretty much standard part for the course. This uses a SATA 3 interface. It is an M2 form factor SSD. Isn't this getting confusing? M2 just means it's the gum stick drive with three little legs on the connector accessible from the bottom, but uses a SATA interface. So no PCIe here. Honest to goodness, SSDs are fast enough. I don't think most people are really going to notice the difference. Anyway, there's the results from our 256 gig SSD. RAM is soldered on, by the way. You have access to the wireless card, which is a Intel 7265, this 80211. AC with Bluetooth 4.0 and that has MIMO 2x2 antenna design there. Now, HP supposedly just machine framed the whole case here so they could run the wire exactly to get the best reception. It does have good wireless reception. So benchmark numbers. PC Mark 7 5304. That's a very good number there. It does help. It has a Core i7 which should give us about 10% improvement in performance over a Core i5. It is dual core. All ULV 15 watt CPUs in Intel land are still dual core CPUs no matter what. PC Mark 8, also a good number, 3,053. We're often mid 2000s, is what we see for some Ultrabooks. W Prime and Computed Pi in 17.4 seconds, 18.8 seconds, the longer it takes, the lower, the worse it is, would be the average for Core i5 Ultrabooks. And Core i7s typically just do a little bit better. So this is still a little higher than we would expect for a Core i7. Geekbench 3, single core 3,094, multi core 6,428. So, definitely a good showing there. Obviously, the machine is versatile. I don't know how many of you want to use it flat like this unless you're playing air hockey on the touchscreen, which you could do if you wanted to do. But it's nice to know that you can use this as a tablet if you wish on the couch. In fact, I have a cold right now and I was enjoying crashing on the couch and just sitting on my lap like that. It's very easy to use the screen. Thanks to the three multi-gear, three-gear hinge that they have inside, this thing is pretty darn sturdy, so you can tap and stuff like that. I mean, you can be a brute and smash at it, and it might move a little bit, but other than that, it stays pretty sturdy in whatever position you put it in. Of course, if you need to space save on an airplane tray table, there's that mode of using it as well. And of course, outright tablet mode. So when you're trying to decide between this and some of the other similarly priced Ultrabooks on the market, some of them even higher, like say the Dell XPS 13, where you have to go up to $1,300 just to get the touchscreen if you want one of those. Consider this if you like the versatility of a convertible design. It, even though HP did a pretty good job of keeping the weight and the thickness down here, it's 3.2 pounds, it's still heavier than the XPS 13, for example, which is 2.6 to 2.8 pounds. But if you like the idea of using this as a tablet or just setting it up to watch a movie in either presentation or tent mode, any of those kinds of things, drawing with your finger, this does not have an active digitizer display. There is no active pen, so it's really not for our work. Then this would be a good choice. Obviously, it also completes with the both the, the MacBook Air and I think maybe even more so the 13-inch Retina MacBook Pro as well. And then there are some Lenovo offerings, too. We can't ignore the Lenovo Yoga 3 Pro, which was one of the first Broadwell machines to come out, but that does run on the Core M CPU, so it doesn't do computation nearly as fast as this. If, you're, if your needs are light, you just do Word and Web and email and that sort of thing, then Core M can be fine for you. But if you need to encode video, you, you export even your HD, full HD video be recorded with your smartphone after putting it through Windows Movie Maker, then you want more horsepower. And then there's the Acer Aspire R13, which we recently did a video review of, which is the uh, aesthetically challenged, shall we say, competitor to this, but that does have a pen. Anyway, to test out video playback, we're going to use that so you can see that as well. And listen to these speakers set at 66% volume. from Mobile Tech Review, and today we're going to look at the Acer Aspire R13. This is a 13.3 inch Windows convertible laptop. This runs on Intel Core U-series CPUs, Core i5, Core i7. 
Well, I would say that sounds convincing like me and pretty darn loud too. So that's, that's nice, especially when the 13-inch MacBook Pro Retina display on the Dell XPS 13 have such good speakers. You really want to have that. And by the way, this has DTS audio. I noticed that the audio got much better sounding when I actually went into that control panel and tweaked the sound settings a bit. So here's our DTS audio. I just went to listening experience and checked the audio enhancement. It went for 3D movie. Seems to be an overall good compromise for actually understanding dialogue, and press, adding up on the midtones, and still bringing up your bass a little bit too. So how about battery life? Obviously the battery is sealed inside nominally. If you undo the torque screws that are here, 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 mind you that the screw here and the screw here are longer, so remember that when you put it back together. You could get access to the battery to service it inside here happily, by the way. You can have access to the SSD drive and to your wireless card. RAM is permanently soldered on board, but it's at 8 gigs, so that's not so bad. Anyway, battery life, 56 watt hour, 3 cell battery. That's a pretty good capacity battery in there. Usually we see 45 to 50 or so. Intel Broadwell is obviously very good at power savings. That was the whole point of the fifth generation CPU. Depending on what you're doing, it's better at lower power states. So a lot of the time we just sit there, we, we type some sentences in Word, we think, we, you know. For those kind of use cases, you're going to get the longest battery life. And that's what makes it kind of hard to estimate Broadwell battery life. But in our usual real-life test, which is a mix of playing a one-hour episode on Netflix, playing several short YouTube videos, doing Word and Excel, email, web browsing with five to ten tabs open, a little music playback in the background, at 50% brightness, which is pretty darn adequate given how bright this display is, and Wi-Fi obviously on since we're streaming video, we average eight to nine hours. That's not bad at all. It's not going to be granted the Mac Book Air, but it's still quite good for a Windows laptop, especially one with a Core i7 CPU. Now that is with the 1080p display. With the higher resolution display, you're probably going to knock an hour off the battery life. In fact, HP claims 12 hours for this, as ever manufacturers are optimistic, and they claim 10.5 hours for the WQHD display. It comes with Traditional style, but very small, 45 watt charger here, and I swear to God, about 12 feet of cable. So you can be at the front of the Starbucks, bucks, and the outlet can be on the back, and you're still going to be able to plug in. So all in all, I'm extremely impressed for the price. You have this really beautiful looking laptop here with the beautifully machined casing, the the jewel cut sides that look nice, the very good 360 degree hinge, lovely IPS displays, a very workable keyboard, oversized trackpad if that's your thing. Well, you certainly got the biggest trackpad I've ever seen. HP is into that. And the price range is good. As I said, you can get this as low as $899 for your usual Core i5 with 4 gigs of RAM and 120 gig SSD. Our model with the Core i7, 256 gig SSD and 8 gigs of RAM is $1149. And there's a $990 model, $999 model that gets you the Core i5, 8 gigs of RAM and a 256 gig SSD. And of course, there's the one with the high resolution display, everything to the max, 512 gigs of RAM, the Core i7, and that one is $1399. All in all, HP did a wonderful job. The Spectre is a home run. So that's the HP Spectre X360. It's available now and again at a variety of price points starting at, for a high-end Ultrabook, a relatively affordable $899. And you can go all the way up to WQHD display and 512 gig SSD for $1399, which compared to some of the competition from Dell and Apple is really pretty nice. It's gorgeous looking, it's well put together, it's fast, it's versatile, convertible, definitely a good pick. I'm Lisa from Mobile Tech Review. Be sure to visit mobiletechreview.com for our full written review and hit that like button.